What's going on everyone? My name is Mark and welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel for the first time. Now if you clicked into this video, then today, you get to watch me 3D print and process yet again another wonderful helmet from the Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian. As always, every resource that was utilized is annotated in the video description, including the web address where the STLs for this model can be purchased. Today's model originated from Marco Macage over at Mystery Maker Studio. This Etsy store has an amazing selection of quality STLs primarily based around Star Wars. Given the overall quality of my print, I have nothing but positive things to say about the files that I purchased. To kick things off, I started by sanding my entire model with 80 grit sandpaper. At this stage, the goal is not to wipe away every layer line, but to eliminate as many high points as possible. Anything that is missed during this step can be later filled in and re-sanded with a higher grit sandpaper. For those who are less enthusiastic about sanding, I will at least say that 80 grit is the most difficult stage to sand at due to the sheer amount of elbow grease needed to thoroughly sand PLA filament, so at least the worst is behind you. From here, sandable filler primer can be applied very liberally. I encourage spraying so heavily because the overall goal is to leave behind little to no trace of layer lines, so by overspraying the model, the low points are being built up to even out the overall surface of your print. Even if you spray so much that certain areas gunk up and you end up with paint runs, everything can always be sanded back down to even it all out again. So in this instance, that kind of thing is perfectly fine. Also, on a side note, I'm not the type of person to typically preach about shop safety, but whenever you're spraying, sanding, or applying any kind of putty that has a picture on the packaging that looks just like this, it's always recommended to wear proper breathing protection as the particulate from these materials are carcinogenic. So even if you already knew this, respectfully, remember to be safe moving forward. To touch up on glazing spot putty specifically, be sure to wear nitrile gloves to avoid skin contact whenever you're handling it, as I'm certain that you don't want your skin absorbing whatever wonderful chemicals that this stuff is made of. And of course, this material does release a vapor that you shouldn't breathe in, so make sure to wear breathing protection as well. The great thing about Spot Putty is that it usually only takes about 30 minutes to an hour to dry, and then it should be ready for sanding. At this stage, materials like the ones that were just applied are generally pretty soft in comparison to the plastic that they are resting upon, meaning that the grade of sandpaper being used should only be coarse enough to sand through such materials and not coarse enough to affect the plastic underneath. For this, I recommend 320 grit sandpaper. You may also find it beneficial to repeat the last three previous steps of spraying, puttying, and sanding until your model is up to your standards. But when you're ready to move on to the next step, you can go ahead and spray down the model with some gloss black spray paint. The idea behind using gloss black at this stage is that when the paint fully dries, a lot of the scratches that were created from the 320 grit sandpaper will be more visible. This provides an excellent opportunity to move up the ladder and sand down the model with yet again an even higher grade of sandpaper. With 600 grit in hand, we are moving into territory where the model is going to become exceptionally smooth, so much to the point that the already existing paint that's on the model may appear to have a sheen to it, even without having a fresh, untouched coat of gloss finish surrounding it. And although it clearly has some shine to it, the glossier this model is prior to applying metallic enamel, the more reflective the finish will appear to be. So, once more, the helmet was sprayed down with some gloss black spray paint, filling in any existing micro scratches and further perfecting the outer surface of the helmet. Before I even finished spraying, this time around, I could already tell that there was a significant difference in the visibility of the surface scratches, as they were almost non-existent meaning simply that the 600 grit sandpaper did what it was meant to do. So, now focusing on metallics, the finish that I decided to go with was Tester's Gold Enamel. It's a paint that is primarily used on smaller scale models and can be applied with a regular brush or an airbrush like the one that I'm using. 
Hopefully, the footage that I've placed before you effectively illustrates why it is so important that this model was sanded all the way up to 600 grit sandpaper and then resprayed with gloss black prior to applying metallics. Personally, I feel like this finish came out beautifully. However, I don't exactly want this helmet to look immaculate either. If anyone remembers Season 1 of The Mandalorian, I'm certain that you can recall that this character is only ever seen hanging out in a sewer with a bunch of other religious zealots seeking to re-establish the way which was an ancient faith that had fallen out of favor with mainstream Mandalorian society. So, with that in mind, I mixed up some green and brown acrylic paint, diluted it with water, and gave this helmet a thorough dirt wash. Once that dried, I wanted there to be some layer of protection between any potential outside elements and the, mind you, water-soluble acrylic paint that I had just applied to the outside of the helmet. Also, when the acrylic dried, it didn't have the same finish as the enamel underneath of it, so I needed a clear coat that would gloss everything back up without affecting the reflectivity of the gold enamel very much. Here's the product that I used. It's called Duplicolor 1K Clear Extreme Gloss Finish Spray Paint. It's $30 a can, and due to that fact alone, I'm more than certain that many of you are asking, was it worth the purchase? Well, I can tell you that aside from the example in front of you, I've used it on other metallics, and I'm yet to complain about this product's performance. Now, if you do happen to make the investment in such an expensive can of spray paint, the item's description on Amazon says that it dries to touch in 15 minutes and can be handled within an hour. However, I do recommend that you allow this to set for 24, if not 48 hours, just to be safe. Switching gears, we finally get to focus on something else aside from the helmet, which, as I'm writing this dialogue, I actually feel somewhat a sense of relief, as it is nice to change things up every now and then. So, here are a few specifics on making a T-shaped visor. In the past, I've used a similar visor that had a green tint to it, and some of you guys have expressed in past videos that you felt uneasy about it being tinted green. So, to exempt that interaction altogether, go look up Hobart Face Shield Replacement Number 3. The tinting, when looking through it, is closer to a light blue, and when the helmet is being worn, it appears to be black from a third-person perspective. If you're looking for a walkthrough on how to make a T-Visor template similar to the one that you saw me use in this video, go check out Let's Make a Boba Fett Helmet Part 1, where I go into great detail in explaining how templates like this can be made. Do keep in mind that this was my first video, so it's a little dated, so please excuse the crudity of that video. If anyone were to prefer that I make a separate, short video on how to make a visor template, please let me know in the comments section, as I would be more than happy to put out an up-to-date video that more closely matches my current video format and has better audio quality. Also, speaking of new videos, I want to provide you guys with a small preview of my next upcoming video, which will be covering the making of a Metroid Prime 3 Samus helmet, but with my own twist, as I wanted to make it look battle damaged. I'll most likely have that video out in a couple of weeks, so be sure to keep an eye out for that as well. Beyond that, the upcoming Stormtrooper helmet has been printed, and I'm still printing the Tusken Raider. Although I can't show you those two helmets just yet, I want to go ahead and provide an update on a Chestburster Stasis Pod build video that I'm beyond excited to release. If you guys want to see it fully assembled, I released a teaser trailer for it about a month ago through YouTube Shorts, so go check that out as well. And finally, we have arrived at the last step in the video, which is when I installed the T-Visor to the inside of the helmet. I made sure to first tape up the side of the visor that will be making contact with glue, and left myself about a quarter inch of space around the contour of the visor exposed, so I could scuff it with 80 grit sandpaper. This will help keep the glue adhered to the surface of the visor. Sanding with such a coarse grade of sandpaper establishes grooves that the glue is able to sink down into and bond with more effectively. And as you may have noticed, I first tacked the visor into place with gel super glue and super glue activator, and then followed up around the contour of the visor with hot glue. To go back for a second, sanding the inside of the helmet shouldn't be necessary due to already existing layer lines that have no issues with adhesion. So, that my friends wraps up this video, so if you enjoyed what you just watched, go ahead and give this video all of the love and praise that you think it deserves. I hope you'll join me next time, and as always, Thanks for watching.